Mariava, Wakil Duda Basar, America Sedrakat di Indonesia. Menyambu datangnya bulan Ramadan, saya mendoakan keberkahan selama sebulan penuh bagi semua yang menjalani. Di saat-saat penuh, ketidakpastian dan kecemasan yang sedang berlangsung saat ini, saya terinspirasi oleh berbagai kisah mengenai harapan, kemanusiaan dan kerdamawanan yang tak terhitung yang kita miliki bersama. Semoga bulan ini memperkuat persahabatan kita. Selamat menunaikan ibadah puasa. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Ad America TV. Hi, I'm Maya Trainer. I'm one of the guides here at Ad America, and we welcome our audience joining us online. We truly hope that you are doing well and stay safe amidst this outbreak. Well, anyway, for those of you who are first timers here, hi, welcome to Ad America TV for the first time. Ad America is the U.S. Embassy's American Center, and our mission is to provide a space for young generations of Indonesia to learn more about the United States. We have temporarily moved to a solely digital platform so you can enjoy our program from the comfort of your own home and help fund the curve of COVID-19. Don't forget to leave your questions in the comment box below and our panelists will answer them later in the seminar. And for today's session, we will be having a discussion titled Women Journalists Brave the Pandemic. A friendly reminder for all of you as continuation of our 10th anniversary celebration and a full month celebration of Earth Day, we are having a very special activities with giveaways this month. In this giveaway, we're giving out not three, not four, but five folding bikes. How exciting! So make sure to stay tuned till the end of this event to know how to participate. In the meantime, I will break the ice a little bit with our social media quiz. So our question of the day is, is it true or false that Ruhana Kudus was the first female Indonesian journalist? I will repeat the question one more time. Listen carefully. Okay, so is it true or false that Ruhana Kudus was the first female Indonesian journalist? You can participate this quiz through our social media comment section and stay tuned till the end of this event to find out if you got the answers right. Now, before we begin, here's an opening remarks from Ibu Sita Raider, Deputy Press Attaché, U.S. Embassy, Jakarta. Good afternoon, everyone from Jakarta, and thank you for turning in to Ad America from Indonesia, the Philippines, and Thailand. Selamat siang, kumusta, sawadika. Thank you for joining us. I would like to thank our panelists, Hannah, Ika, Carmela, and Nata, all of whom are alumni of US exchange programs for lending their expertise and supporting today's discussion. My name is Sita Ryder. I'm the deputy press attache at the US Embassy in Jakarta, Indonesia. The US government is very pleased to support today's discussion entitled Women Journalists Brave the Pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected our lives in many ways, and today we will hear about its effect on gender inequality in the media industry. A survey by the International Federation of Journalists found an increase in gender inequality in the media industry during the pandemic in 52 countries. The pandemic has been shown to place a greater burden on women as they have taken on the majority of childcare, and yet they also face greater job losses and even deliberate efforts to deny, to deny them leadership roles. At the same time, a study by Factual, a California-based technology company, found that female journalists produce more trustworthy and credible reports on the pandemic. How are women journalists across the globe responding to these challenges? The U.S. mission in Jakarta is very pleased to partner with the U.S. missions in Manila and Bangkok for one of the first regional discussions on our Ad America virtual platform that brings together media experts from other Southeast Asian countries. Today's discussion aims to promote women's voices in the media, to celebrate women's achievements in journalism, and to address the challenges that women media practitioners face. We hope this event is valuable for working journalists and serves as a reminder of the important role you all play by providing the public with credible information. And we also hope that aspiring journals, journalists will find inspiration in the biographies of our panelists. 
So well, thank you again for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy today's discussion. Terima kasih, selamat po kogumka. All right, thank you so much, Mrs. Reiter, for the opening remarks. And now, without further ado, please welcome our moderator for today, Mbak Hana Fauzi, Deputy Editor-in-Chief, Koran Sindo and Sindonews.com. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everyone to joining uh, this very special session. It's very, very special because we are going to meet some of fabulous, fantastic uh, panelists with us today. And uh, without the further ado, I will introduce our panelists. We have Nata Komoludin. I hope I'm not wrong in mentioning your name, Nata. All right. Is it good? Okay. Uh, Nata is one of the most famous television anchor and commentator. She runs the, the very special program called the This Is Thai PBS program, a weekday nightly uh, current affairs program. Nata also a producer, a produced special series based on exclusive interview with leading personalities. Previously, Nata was a reporter at the International Business News Desk, ITV, and later as the presenter and translator for the BBC a Thai section World Service in Lon uh, London, right, Nata? Yes. She also has won the most popular uh, news anchor, Mekala Award by the Entertainer, Entertainment Journalist Association of Thailand and Best TV News Anchor. Congratulations on your achievement, Nata. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very kind introduction. Okay, Swadika, I forgot to say that, Nata. <laughs> and our second uh, panelist is from uh, Philippines, Mabuhay. Carmela Von Buena is the Mabuhay. Mabuhay, uh, is the uh, executive director of the Philippine Center of Investigative Journalism. Um, she was a senior reporter. She's so experienced. Um, I adore her really, and also that she worked as a researcher, right, uh, Carmela? Yes, yes. For yeah. news break. She has been a journalist for 17 years, same like, my, uh, like me, uh, Carmela, specializing in the elections, national security, and also writes a lot of books. You should share it with, uh, uh, with us later on, Carmela. I will, I will. And the third one, we have Ika from Indonesia. Hi, Mbak Ika, apa kabar? Hai Mbak Hana, kabar baik. Nah, Terima kasih. Nah, Mbak Ika is the uh, Secretary General of AJI, Alliance of Independent Journalists here in Indonesia. You are based in Jakarta, right Mbak Ika? Yes, right. Nah, uh, she's been a journalist for 12 years and a fact checker at Tempo one of the leading media in Indonesia for the past two years. And she also an expert trainer in environment issue, uh, disaster, uh, gender equality, uh, fact checking, citizen journalism. You have so much in, in, in your hands, right? Uh, <laughs> Thank you for your kind. <laughs> yes. But before we jump into our discussion, I would like to say hi for our two our lecturers, teachers, audience, and students from the uh, UIN Sharif Hidayatullah in Jakarta. Hello, everyone. UIN, so, UIN Walisongo Semarang, Universitas Indonesia, Universitas Al-Azhar Indonesia, Pesan, Pondok Pesantren Dar El Kolam, also, I would like to say hi to Atmajaya, Universitas Atmajaya, UNM, Undip Semarang, Universitas Palangkaraya, Universitas Erlangga, dan Universitas Pajajaran di Bandung. And I also want to remind 
all of you that the discussion is the collaborations between the three U.S. embassies here in Jakarta, uh, in the uh, Philippines, Manila, and also in Bangkok, Thailand. And I also wa want to say warm regards to our uh, U.S. embassy in the Philippines and also in Thailand, who also watch us. I hope you have a very great time and fruitful discussion with us. And uh, before, uh, I would like to, to please Nata to start the presentations. Uh, please, Nata, take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And I'm very honored to be joining this panel of discussion of women journalists brave the pandemic. This is a view from Thailand. So please also show my PowerPoint as well from the first slide. And of course, we are now facing challenge of the pandemic, not only women journalists, but today I try to concentrate and focus on how Thai women journalists are doing our job. So first of all, let me show you context of Thailand. Next slide, please. please. COVID-19 context of Thailand. Right now we are facing third wave of the pandemic. From the beginning of last year, since the news broke out that we were facing the pandemic, the news organization like Thai PBS, where I'm working, has been, have to adapt quite a lot. But this year it's even getting quite worse because of the widespread of the pandemic. Right now, we are having more than 1,000 cases of new infections each day, and it's higher, higher, much higher than last year. And the cluster from entertainment venue is the cause of the latest wave of infection. So you can see how the cluster of infection comes from Bangkok, especially in central area of Bangkok from entertainment venue. And we have lots of cases like minister, leading people, influencer, famous actor, actress have been reported of having infection this time round. And right now we see how medical personnel, health worker and frontline medical workers are working against time in, in order to help people who are infected with COVID-19. But right now people are so worried with enough space on hospitals and facilities, medical facilities, whether it will be enough to accommodate all the infection cases. But last year, Thailand was very much pressed by World Health Organization because the case of new infection was quite limited in Thailand. And it seems that the government has handled it quite okay in terms of having live press conference and also health volunteer Health volunteers are people who have been working in each village in different parts of Thailand. And we have like 100,000 around the country who can keep the whole community informed with the infection and then notify the public sector quite urgently. So that part of the success for, of Thailand last year. But this year we are facing much bigger challenge because of the new cases of, of infection, which has been rising quite rapidly each day. So what journalists have to do, many of us have to try to change our work mode and many of us have to work from home and work online. So next slide, this is what I've been working right now. The thing is because of one of cameraman in the studio that I am working each night was infected with COVID-19. So I was ordered to stay home, to have self-quarantine, to be at home for 14 days. And I have swapped taste for three times already. And I have no infection. It's negative. But in order to keep everyone to be okay mentally, because I am regarded as one of the highest risk group. So I have to be working from home right now. So what I'm doing, I have to do live program at home, interview at home and 
doing program with my co-anchor, co-host of another program as well, and try to work with producer team and other production team, the team of my production of the program from home. So it's the way we try to solve the immediate situation and we try to adjust to the pace of COVID-19. But tomorrow I will have to be back to the office because it's up to 14 days already. And thanks to my team as well that not any one of them have been infected with COVID-19. And talking about, next slide please, talking about Thai PBS women journalists. In fact, we have many of them, but these are three main journalists at the Thai PBS at my station that they have been working quite continuously, going out in field work, even though it's very difficult time, very sensitive, very vulnerable time, for them, they have their families, they have their family members to take care of their parents, but they still have to go out, meet people and try to interview people on the field, especially the middle one. The middle one, her name is Patra Pon Tangam. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide of my presentation. ที่บ้านนะคะมันต้องมีวินัยสูงแล้วก็ต้องมีพื้นที่เฉพาะที่ไม่ไม่ได้พบเจอผู้คนเลี่ยงจุดสัมผัสร่วมต่างๆในครอ
to try to tell people and keep public informed about what the situation is and what's the experience in other countries, especially among ASEAN countries as well. Next slide. So what's the issue that women journalists are facing during COVID-19? It's quite dangerous to be on the ground and to really listen to people's experience. It's quite dangerous and higher risk for them, but they still have to show the Thai public what's the voice of the voiceless or direct experience of those people who are facing difficult situation because of COVID-19. And at the same time, they have to keep that guard up from the clip. You can see, you could see how they have to wear masks, keep social distancing, and for the interview, they cannot be too close to the people who they like to interview. So they, ha they have to keep social distancing. And also they have to keep their timeline just in case they were discovered later that they have COVID-19 so they can show their timeline right away. That's part of the protection and that's part of responsibility of women journalists right now. And next slide, please. So what can be prepared for the future? I think it's the new challenge and many journalists I mean, journalists all over the world are facing the same thing. So in the near future, probably the knowledge on scientific knowledge about vaccine, about pandemic, about virus has to be more common among journalists who have to cover all this pandemic. And for women journalists, they have their ears, their eyes and their will to listen to people's life and the difficulty that people are facing. So we have to care for them as well because they are caregiver and they are exposing to greater risk of infection. And they also have economic burden, which are quite common among female journalists that they have so many responsibility to try to take care of at the same time. But luckily, because at the Thai PBS, we have a few of our staff who have been infected with COVID-19 and the management team has put priority on having swab tests. So they asked hospital to provide this facility for women journalists, not only women journalists, but all the staff team at the Thai PBS to have swab, swab test in the office so that what the management can help and our management, our managing director is also a woman and she cares so much about well-being of staff right now. And she really appreciate how we have to manage our team. About half are working from home and about half are working in the office. And we have to be prepared for the near future in case more of us have to be working from home. So that's the story, brief story of how women Thai women journalists are facing difficult situation. The one that I mentioned, Kun Patra Pond, the one in the middle, she needs to live in Samut Prakan, Samut Sakhon province for two months. Imagine that she couldn't go home for two months because she was regarded as highest risk group, but she carry on working at the same time. And I feel that she sacrificed a lot and very committed, very dedicated to her work. And that's part of responsibility of a journalist as well. And I, I could see how she is so determined as a woman journalist. So that story from Thailand and what we have experiencing as a journalist during this COVID-19. Thank you so much, Nata, for sharing your very wonderful stories. And we are glad that you are okay. And before we Thank move you. to Carmela, I would like to say that um, if you guys, the audience, have any questions, please, please drop in the question box and I will bring it up later to our panelists. Okay, Carmela, now it's your turn. Please keep your presentation. <laughs> Can can you see my presentation? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. Okay. 
I yeah. am Carmela. Um, good afternoon to my fellow journalists in Southeast Asia, students, media stakeholders who are here with us. So the U.S. Embassy in Manila, Jakarta, and Bangkok. Thank you for the invitation. I am truly honored to be speaking before you. Um, I, I want to speak about my experience. 2020 was difficult for all of us. The pandemic turned our worlds upside down. Um, I was a freelance journalist last year um, who needed to travel a lot for my stories. The last story I remember I worked on where I was still able to travel was the COVID-19 outbreak on the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which I wrote with the regional correspondent of The Guardian. We tracked um, crew members of the cruise ship in provinces outside Metro Manila. And after that, I found myself mostly grounded at home. Thankfully, because of technology, we had been able to continue our work. And although it's, it's really different when you are able to do field work, I also found personal triumph last year in being able to finish and publish as I had intended before the pandemic made everything difficult, my book on the 2017 Marawi siege. I had submitted a first draft of the book before the pandemic, but I was still planning to make um, a few trips to, in to improve some chapters. And I was at the time making arrangements with the commander of Sulu, I remember, um, to make a trip there. So what happened was all the trips were canceled. A lot of my interviews um, were done on Zoom. So that's, that's a lot of Zoom calls in order to finish everything. So I want to talk a little bit about the Marawi siege because terrorism is a common threat our countries face. And the pandemic didn't really put a stop to these conflicts. In fact, COVID, COVID made the lives of displaced people so much worse. Uh, and I wrote a story about this. Um, I can't seem to move my, there. So this is the book. Um, so in 2020, I released a book and reported for various news organizations like The Guardian, mostly The Guardian, but also Rappler and the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. In 2021, this year, I have a new job. Um, I joined the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism as executive director. Um, it's a huge honor. I was entrusted to lead an esteemed news organization in the Philippines. It's also a huge challenge. I took this leadership role at the time when the Philippine media is facing a very difficult time. And it's difficult because of the pandemic, certainly, but it's also because um, press freedom in the Philippines um, has faced many challenges. Um, it has been even before the pandemic. PCIJ itself, um, because of its investigative reports, had been falsely accused of destabilization. Um, these are personal milestones in my career as a journalist, and both happened during the pandemic. What I'd like to share um, with you are the two most important lessons that my work in the past year have emphasized to me. And that is one, how journalism, good journalism, is crucial during crisis, be it war or pandemic. Performing a role to provide reliable information to the public can, in extreme instances, spell life and death. And two, pandemic or no pandemic, we women shouldn't be hesitating to take leadership positions we should be embracing these opportunities. Um, public trust uh, on the mainstream media, on the traditional media, has suffered in recent years. This has been a global trend. We're not perfect. We have our faults. But what we have seen in recent years are politically motivated attacks to discredit the media in order to advance various political agenda. But crises like the Marawi siege, and the coronavirus the pandemic have highlighted the media's crucial role in informing the public. This really was my takeaway from the siege of Marawi. I saw the dangers of misinformation, disinformation, and outright lies, which spread fast on social media during the siege. I remember we arrived in Iligan City on the second um, day of the siege. It's the city that's um, an hour's drive from Marawi and where most journalists stayed. We drove to and from Marawi every day to cover. The second night of the siege, um, Facebook erupted with claims that the city, Iligan City, was going on a lockdown at midnight and no one can enter, no one can leave. So if that were true, 
it would have spelled a big problem for our team because lockdown would have prevented us from going to Marawi and doing our job. Um, we would have probably needed to find another town where we could stay. Um, and But it wasn't true. There was curfew because of martial, because martial law had been imposed, but the city didn't go into lockdown. But it, the amount of work it took just to set the record straight that same night, um, it, it, it was hard. And I and our local correspondent, in 2017, I was a reporter for Rappler.com. We had to find the right people to be able to um, correct, correct the information. So thankfully, we didn't have to find another place um, to stay. And imagine those were our own concerns. Imagine what a lockdown would have meant for the residents of Marawi, who were at the time already evacuating in droves um, towards Iligan City, which is a transportation hub. If they couldn't go to Iligan City, if they had nowhere to go, they would have probably decided to stay in their homes. And we know that many people who decided to stay in their homes during the first days those who didn't immediately leave the battle area in the early days were trapped and many civilians were killed inside the battle area. So it was very important to correct misinformation immediately. The coronavirus pandemic brought chaos into the world and mostly in densely populated cities. In Manila, we suffered one of the world's longest lockdowns. People were hoarding groceries and supplies, hospitals were full, there were a lot of checkpoints to restrict movements. And sometimes there will be some problems in the checkpoints. People would get harassed. One was even killed in a misunderstanding at the checkpoint. I couldn't help but think how the country's capital was somehow subjected a little bit um, to war conditions. People were so afraid. People, we, were all, we all felt unsafe and insecure. And again, Misinformation, disinformation, and outright lies spread so fast on social media and made a lot of things worse. Um, there's a lot of misinformation that went around. People were saying, for example, that COVID-19 wasn't real. They're saying falsely that it's not deadlier than flu and supposedly 99% would recover from the disease. There have been um, information also that eating bananas could prevent coronavirus or that gasoline can disinfect masks, steam inhalation as a cure, um, and so is gargling salt water. So this, all these are not true. And the media really had to fact check a lot of this information um, during the pandemic until now to correct all these lies and warn people about these lies. And although we don't really know how many people who believe these lies were eventually infected, you know, because they did follow safety protocols and because they dismissed their symptoms until it was too late. I think it, it, uh, it really emphasizes the um, importance of our role. Now I want to talk briefly about PCIJ. In January, I joined the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism as executive director. Um, this is the part where I want to talk about the second important lesson I learned from the past year, which I should have learned much earlier. It's about the gender confidence gap, um, pandemic or no pandemic. This is important, I think. Studies have shown that men are far more comfortable with self-promotion than our women. We evaluate our performance less favorably. Um, and obviously, this is wrong. And we need to overcome this. I was recruited um, to apply for the position, but it took me a long time to decide to apply because I certainly doubted that I could lead a news organization. Um, but how did I eventually overcome the gender confidence gap? Um, I have strong support network composed of senior women journalists. They have been my mentors and I consulted them. They encouraged me, they believed in me, and they told me I could do it. And that meant a lot. Um, it has been the same support network that helped me and guided me when I decided to write um, the Marawi book. Uh, it's the same network that taught me to take advantage of scholarships and fellowships. Um, and I was privileged to have been able to, to join two exchange programs. I want to mention this, um, two U.S. exchange programs. In 2012, I, I joined a reporting tour on the U.S. presidential elections. Um, elections. And then in 2018, I finished a security course at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii. So that was fun. 
these two programs help me hone my expertise on two areas I focus on as a journalist, elections and security, um, as, as my introduction um, mentioned. And it's not just uh, really what I learned from these programs. It's the friendship and the network of experts that I gained from these programs that were even more valuable. I've certainly taken advantage of these networks and I've, I've had access to experts who I have interviewed for many of my stories. In my new role, PCIJ right now is looking at two important issues um, to focus on. One is the role of scrutinizing. Um, this is a photo of, of the networks I've built from the exchanges. One, um, what is our role in scrutinizing the pandemic response of government, which includes the stimulus packages that they have offered the people? And, and with this, I would like to take this opportunity because uh, the audience uh, uh, among you are, are journalists in the region. I want to talk about our collaboration with um, Tempo Institute of Indonesia and Kini Academy of Malaysia for a training and reporting program on COVID-19 stimulus packages. Packages, And there's a lot we can learn from each other's experiences and we can work together. I hope that some of you can, can apply. The other big issue will be elections and particularly for the Philippines because we will have presidential elections next year. The pandemic has certainly tested the leadership of elected officials and we will need to remind voters of the value of electing good leaders because it means good or bad response during a pandemic. I also want to mention our work with PPMN for Data Talk Asia. It's a data resource portal that we hope you will check out. We hope that you will find it useful. Um, in closing, let me just say that I think we will continue to face challenges in performing our jobs, but we will need to continue to persevere because it, it's it, what we do is really important. Sometimes we will even need to assert our rights to be able to do our job. Um, but please stay safe. Um, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Carmela, for a very sharp presentation <laughs> and very inspiring. And I, I, I really love the way you mentioned that uh, in during the pandemic that women should embrace all the opportunities. And also, just like Nata said earlier, that journalists is the voice of the voiceless and the less opportunist people. And that's very inspiring. And now we move to Mbak Ika. Silahkan Mbak Ika, please share your story with us. Thank you Mbak Hanna and hello uh, everyone. I'm Ika Nintias from uh, Aji. Okay, Aji is a alien of independent journalist in Indonesia. Our organization was uh, founded in 1994. And uh, currently, we have uh, more than uh, or near 2,000 members. I have been a journalist uh, for Tempo for uh, 10 years. And for the last two years, I have focused on uh, being a fact-checking journalist. Sorry, OK. I'm sure you already know how the COVID-19 uh, in Indonesia, since uh, President Jokowi announced the first case in early March in last year, the current number of uh, positive cases has reached more than uh, 1 million. The death rate due to COVID-19 in Indonesia is the highest in uh, Southeast Asia. The same condition must be experienced by many other countries, how uh, this pandemic has not only hit health service, but also all aspects of life, including the media industry. I compiled uh, the impact of the pandemic on various sectors of the media industry, in, in print, radio, television, and uh, online. They are effective because uh, of reduced advertising and reduced revenue. Many of them in the town, uh, reducing the number of uh, journalists and uh, reducing salaries. This is a, a serious blow to the media, even to, uh, during the pandemic. 
and independent media prison is arguably needed by the on uh, my experience, uh, my other team in Temple and other, and how uh, our organization offer uh, the program to have uh, other journalists in Indonesia. Okay, this uh, condition has a um, serious impact on decreasing the welfare of journalists. The result of 700 journalists so that 80% of them are economically affected. This survey involved 20% uh, of female journalists. In some cases, they has result in journalists working harder in other sector. Female journalists are more prone to experiencing double uh, burden because they still have to do domestic work that is accompanying their children to study from home. Yeah, um, I have uh, an experience when my husband got uh, COVID-19 and had a long uh, COVID impact. Mm -hmm. I had to work harder while handling household core, but now we can finally share the task. Even so, I'm sure that not all women journalists have the support of the system for their families because our culture is still uh, very patriarchal. On the other hand, as a fact-checking uh, journalist, I face an onset of epidemic on various social media. The amount is two or three times uh, the hoax circulating during the election uh, periods. This makes debunking uh, hoaxes uh, heavier than before the pandemic. While hoaxes uh, circulated uh, quickly, my job was also demanded to be faster. Mm. Yeah, um, on the other hand, when depends on the internet is overwhelming, digital attack on journalists and the media have uh, only increased. This is a data collection conducted by a SAFNET, an organization engaged in digital rights. Journalists are copied the third position as the group most uh, victim of a uh, digital attack. There are um, various uh, types ranging from doxing, hacking, DDoS attack, and theft of personal data. This situation is quite new compared to professors. So, um, my colleagues and I were one of the victims of uh, doxing in last year. It was done by a veteran media who had a large following on social media. My photo was shared and labeled uh, me as the spreader of the COVID uh, terrorist. <laughs> like that. The incident uh, came after uh, we wrote for fact check uh, article uh, refuting his claim on social media that uh, we get uh, COVID-19 as the common cold. So all this uh, situation causing mental health issue to also increase among uh, journalists based on the survey. Many journalists uh, experience depression and burnout. I have also been in a situation of uh, extreme anxiety when um, uh, my husband was hit by COVID with uh, several symptoms and increased workload and the uncertainty uh, of the future of the work. Okay, and um, the pandemic has been a year and we never know we, uh, this situation will end soon, but with the challenges I face, I choose to keep moving. So uh, that condition for uh, press freedom and welfare would improve. Number of things uh, our organization IG has done and is currently doing who to expand solidarity among journalists and uh, local, national, and global level, also with the Myanmar issue like now. And the second, how we can extend the economic support to affected uh, journalists. The program is covered like a fellowship grant and social fund for uh, journalists affected uh, COVID-19. IG also provide access uh, to the uh, uh, service 
because you know not all the journalists have uh, the good access to uh, physician and we know how the COVID-19 is uh, become uh, many journalists affected uh, for their work and, and like uh, the bad uh, psychology. Yeah, as you know, it's already the state uh, how to protect journalists, including uh, female journalists. And the last one, uh, the flow, uh, we, we, we are uh, arranging how to practice uh, like a guidelines to protection for journalists who are victim of uh, social violence because we have a small uh, survey that it's so um several female journalists be a victim of like the harassment and uh, sexual violence during the pandemic yeah i hope that events like this can expand our solidarity learn uh, from each other to overcome challenges thank you please uh, contact me on the email if you need more information from uh, me or IG. thank you Uh, Mbak Hana. Presentation, which is very interesting. And I love that you mentioned about the mental health issues. It's very important nowadays, especially during the pandemic. And also that how you share that Aji helps the affected journalists here in Indonesia. And... I'd like to ask before I um, let people uh, to share the questions in our uh, questions box that I will read it later. But first, I'd like to ask our panelists, uh, since Nata will leave us in a few minutes, right, Nata? Okay, so the first question goes to you. Based on your own experience during the pandemic, how and what is your tips to overcome the obstacle and also challenging during the COVID-19 pandemic? I think teamwork is really important among journalists at this time, especially support from the office, like facility or equipment to be working from home. I think that's really important. And also to keep journalists know that they are not working alone. So moral support from teamwork from colleagues and management level are really important. And at this very juncture, I can see how the public would like journalists to keep them informed as well. So the point that our fellow friend from Indonesia and from the Philippines told us yeah. about the importance of disinformation, misinformation. It's the situation that's happening in Thailand as well. That means our job as journalists is important than ever in terms of having fact-checking all the rumor. And that's part of the mission that we have to carry on. But of course, we still have, we still need support from our organization as well and from our journalist friends in order to carry on doing our job. Thank you, Nata. Because a lot of our audience is university students, do you have some tips that the media industry is very safe to women especially? Media right now is facing much challenges because of social media, which are having strong competition with all media like TV, radio, and newspaper. But at the same time, we can see how keep being professional is really important because among noises, which is happening in the social media, and it's true on one hand that anyone can be a reporter, but we need high quality reporter reporters who are responsible, who understand the principle of being professional journalists, who have checks and balance, and who have to, who can balance the story and hold the authority accountable. I think that's still 
main mission of journalists. And for young generation, I think you all have equipment. You are tech savvy, but you cannot forget important of fact checking content and keeping your voice very professional because you cannot just report anything you see, but you have to have second opinion and. It's very crucial to have fact checking at this very juncture. So there are opportunities in the crisis of the pandemic COVID-19 at the same time. Thank you so much, Nata, for your answers. Uh, I also like to ask the same questions to our other panelists, to Carmela and also Mbaika. Silakan, uh, Mbaika. Okay, can you repeat uh, with the question, Bahana? Uh, since our audience, a lot of our audience is from the university, student of the universities, mm -hmm. do you have some tips uh, related to the profession of journalists that the media industry is a very safe for women? Mm. Okay, um, I think uh, Indonesia have a uh, big uh, challenging how to bring the women equality with the uh, men worker in media industry. So we need uh, more the uh, program with IG and other journalist um, organization, also with the um, uh, student organization. Yeah, please uh, you can bring many many female uh, journalists and uh, female student uh, journalists to give uh, they uh, have uh, the same chains with um, men uh, journalists because uh, we need uh, the enough number uh, the female journalists in media industry because you know in Indonesia only have um, maybe about 20% of female journalists and also uh, only 6% uh, the female journalists uh, who in the level top management. So the, the condition is the um, acquired gap uh, with the female and also with uh, the main uh, worker. So we need how how the media industry give a um, big um, uh, obligation to give uh, the same um, chain for the female journalists and also with good uh, regulation and good uh, policy policy. So uh, the the female uh, journalists can save. They work in the in media industry. But, Thank you so much, Mbak Ika, for your answer. Uh, Carmela? Yeah, there's been a lot of challenges in the industry for women. I think I want to go back to what I said earlier about the importance of having support networks. And we know that, um, as Ika had uh, shared to us during her presentation, we've been facing a lot of attacks. We've been facing contending with trolls online. Um, and 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 critics offline. What we found out um, with these problems, um, you can draw strength from each other. And sometimes you feel helpless when, when you know, your inboxes, uh, when you put out a story critical of, of, some, of, some, of someone people support and your inbox gets filled with, with hate messages. Sometimes you feel so helpless, you know, reading um, terrible stuff. Um, said to you what we realized though is the value it's, it's really important to have a support network and for for women and even men who support us to bond together and support us a simple um friends um fellow journalists responding to these attacks online helping you fend them off this is very important and yeah i think um that's a very big um thing um, to protect ourselves, um, as and as Ika also mentioned, you know, even in offline circumstances, um, when we go out to the field, uh, um, it helps, you know, when we go to, if we expect there will be problems in certain coverages, for example, it helps if we go there uh, as a group, 
um, yeah. instead of just going there as an individual. So right. we have to be very conscious of these things because we, we need to protect ourselves given yeah. the current circumstances. Yeah, we need to feel safe in doing yeah. our jobs, you know? Uh, I know that Carmela already mentioned on her presentations that the uh, all the speakers are the alumni of the U.S. Uh, government-sponsored program. But I still need to ask the I'd like to ask the our panelists, Nata and also Mbak Ika, what are the skills and experience that you guys gain from the program? From my from the program IVLP Edward Murrow, I joined in 2012, and it was very great tour. I mean, for for journalist for journalist trip to to have exposure to how journalists really work in the U.S. What's the network that they've got, and what's the organization that function, especially. During my year, it was the great opportunity to learn about political unit and political mechanism in the U.S. Really, really important to, to try to get the sense of what different parties are doing and what's the network inside the United States in trying to carry on with the democracy and how people are so vibrant. And especially the role of journalists, especially in the First Amendment, I think that's very crucial for us to learn how the U.S. has treasured this First Amendment in their heart. And that reminds us how media freedom and press freedom are very crucial for the whole society. Thank you, Nata. And how about you, um, Baika? I joined in 2017 on uh, anti-corruption uh, program. I think it's a very good <laughs> challenge for me to uh, know about how the US uh, government uh, fight against the corruption. It's a very fun with uh, our country because uh, Indonesia still have a serious uh, problem until now how to fight the corruption. It's a very, very great uh, program to bring me have a new uh, knowledge about uh, how the journalists can, can uh, have a role to um, bring to investigative journalists. Uh, about the corruption and so on, and and uh, the experience gave me more greater <laughs> in uh, the field and very very uh, useful to my skill in daily in the journalism. Mm. Thank you, Mbak Ika. Uh, I was with the GSMP program in 2015. And the experience was like the once a lifetime experience. It's really shaped the way we think as a journalist. Um, and I really cherish that program a lot. I think all the panelists have the at the same page, right? Right. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. are. <laughs> and we already have lots, lots of questions here, but um, we have from Facebook, from Nuh Marguida. I hope I'm not um, spelling your name wrong. And this is goes to you, Nata. Well, um, <laughs> okay. So I can. <laughs> this is a very, very question. interesting question, yep. Nata. Um, do, do you ever get the threats, including death threats? or external pressure during your career as journalist? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my I can God. say it's yes, but uh, not. Tell, tell us about it. Yeah. yeah. But not like the threat yet. But the, the threat is also coming from people who are not, because you all must be aware of the political context in Thailand in the past yeah. 10 years, and it's very intense. We have different camps like red shirt, yellow shirt, or multicolored shirt. 
And every time, whenever I report on particular shirt, on particular color, people would presume that I am on that side. But in fact, we are trying to be impartial and try to like keep distance as much as we can. And uh, the threat also coming from people who opposed to that color. And when I report, people will presume that I support the other color and I got threat, especially cyber bullying. I got it all the time, mostly, but not as serious as death threat. And at some point, some people try to meet me at the station and I find that's very sensitive and that's, that's not quite safe. So the environment at the organization is really important as well because I work for a public TV station. People <laughs> presume that we all belong to the public. But <laughs> yeah. of course, all the facility and personal safety are really priority. So I have to be careful as well. But cyberbullying, I face it not on daily basis, but mostly I have been through that as well. Oh, wow. Thank, thank you, Nata, for sharing your experience. That's some of experience. It's, oh, uh, is it like yeah. the other uh, panelists receive uh, threats during your career? Uh, Carmela, do you ever receive threats? Uh, there have been, you know, when there was still no social media, you would do investigative stories and you would get threats from yeah it's happened in the past and there's i'm sure um nata and ika um they they are very aware of this that there are things that you must do you know if you face threats um sometimes we think um it's it's different i think it's different when you get this from say a politician you you've um written about and and the context is different now when you get it from social media and some people wouldn't take those seriously, you know, when, when it's a threat on social media. But I think we should. All Any threat, whether um, that's a stranger or unknown on social media, we should take it all seriously. And we need to, journalists should be um, familiarized, you know, with how they can get help. And there are organizations in our countries um, where, uh, that we can approach and seek for help. We need to report. The first thing we need to do really is to report if we feel threatened, if there's a death threat, if we... So we need to report these things and let organizations help us if, if these things happen to us. Don't, don't brush it off. You have to take threats seriously and address them. Thank you, Carmela. And how about you, um, Baika? Yeah, I have mentioned on um, my presentation before if uh, I'm a victim of the doxing in <laughs> last year. So same, I think with uh, Carmela, if the threat of the um, internet era now is increasing in Indonesia, it's a um, very, very uh, serious problem uh, for the press freedom now. Yeah, it just uh, alarm with the... Um, all the journalists in Indonesia to to more uh, secure with uh, their device, uh, their account, social media, social account, and also with uh, all the tools in they use in the daily for uh, uh, coverage in the fields on all the to collect uh, data journalism like that. So. Um, uh, I have a concern in two years to give uh, the training for more than um, maybe it's about uh, 50 journalists, uh, how to can, uh, they can care about uh, the device and also with the digital security uh, right, because now it's very important how to uh, journalists can have uh, the skill how we can to face a uh, digital threat. Thank you, very interesting, Mbak Ika. Now we have another question, but before it, that Nata already leave. So thank you so much, Nata, and we hope we can meet you in person later on. And the next question is from Instagram by the account of Indar Juliardi. 
The question is for the all the speakers. Is there any government regulations in Indonesia and also Philippines uh, in requiring media companies to provide safety and also improving working conditions for women's journalists? Carmela, how about you? How's in Philippines? Uh, it, it's it that's uh, I think even without um, regulations, um, news organizations have been very conscious of this issue. Um, we've had a hist um, we've had instances and we've learned from these experiences. Um, we make sure that when, for example, when we're sending reporters to the field, um, we make sure that if if they're women and it's potentially dangerous for them to go to particular coverages, we make sure that they are protected. Um, these are um, internal. Uh, um, this um, or news organizations have um, arrangements for for their own organizations, and there are organizations also outside um, the news organizations, um, NGOs that uh, we can approach when if if there are issues um, on this. Thank you so much, uh, Carmila, to share the conditions in Philippines. And Baika, how about in our country, Baika? <laughs> yeah, Indonesia uh, don't have uh, the proper uh, regulation for the woman equality because um, we know that we um, are waiting about the. Um, anti-sexual law and more than two years uh, government and the legislative um, has not to decision for the uh, public so it's a uh, very fair so IG is also um, include the, the collaboration with other uh, coalition in Indonesia to to all the government how to give uh, launch the this law and also we need to the press uh, council in Indonesia uh, have um, like a guideline for the um, woman woman or the gender uh, journalism and also we need um, with the other media industry, how they can to give uh, like a policy to protect the, their uh, women journalists from the felons and other. Yeah, so it's, uh, we need uh, the <laughs> big uh, solidarity with other uh, GSO. We, we need to work hand in hand, right, Baika, to overcome all the women issue in journalist, uh, in journalism industries, right? Yeah, I think, um, Hannah, you are also in the industry media. You, you have a special experience about this and also with me. Uh, yeah, um, uh, women journalists until now have... Um, lower welfare uh, like that and the contract uh, status of a journalist worker is dominate with the uh, female journalists and so they are very difficult to can uh, reach out the level top management <laughs> yeah so if uh, if the uh, our our um, Top management only dominate with the male a worker is also is not good for the um, equality uh, policy. So we need how how the the industry media can can seriously and have uh, the big um, responsibility uh, for these issues like that. Right, Maika, and also that. Mm -hmm. As a woman, we need to support women. Support women's right. If already <laughs> exactly. women's already in mm -hmm. the very top positions in media, mm -hmm. uh, in media industry, 
she should help and push and encourage other women to 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 uh, be more seen, to be more seen, right? Yeah. And uh, we have we have another question from YouTube. Uh, we have Nabila Riyadi Pertiwi. Uh, she'd like to ask about the as a female journalist when working. Do you ever feel anxiety and fear, and how you overcome with anxiety and fear prior to the COVID and during the COVID pandemic? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, Carmela, we start yeah. with you. Yeah, I'll talk again about the confidence gap among women. Right, but sometimes we we feel so insecure even um, when we're we're men that are are equals. So I think it, it's I don't know if that's cultural or but we women tend to you know um, be a little less confident about our capabilities. And I think while that happens to us, once we know that this is there's there's a study on this and this is well documented, we should aware of this gender confidence gap, and we should be able to overcome it. That that we can do a lot of things as women. In fact, in the Philippines, a lot of news organizations are led, led by women. Um, so that's a happy note on the part of the Philippines. Several yeah. news organizations are led by women. And and as mentioned, you know, it's it's about women helping women. Um, my mentors are are all women, and they've helped me grow as a journalist. <laughs> That's a very, very nice and very positive to hear, Carmela. <laughs> okay, I think a very different uh, habit uh, before and during uh, pandemic. In pandemic, uh, I work a lot of the <laughs> homework and I can work more than uh, seven hours and sometimes until 12 hours <laughs> in a day <laughs> because you know I'm uh, I'm facing uh, more than <clears throat> 10 uh, infodemic in every day so I must handling uh, in every infodemic uh, be faster before uh, the pandemic so because uh, you know the infodemic uh, bring the faster and faster and can be uh, bad, bad in our society. Yeah, in also can impact in our mental health. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so uh, we need to care about the mental health. Yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah. The pandemic is uh, very challenging in our have a big uh, changing our habit in every day, mental health for every journalist and uh, special. Okay. But and and thanks. if if I may yeah. also add, um, yeah, it, it's yeah. there's a lot of work and sometimes you feel there's more work during the pandemic, right? Because of yeah, right. so many things that are happening. <laughs> So many Zoom meetings, <laughs> and I think yeah. um, it's we, our friends and I. We like to remind ourselves that let's try to have you know not all our Zoom should be about meeting. So we try to get a Zoom call between among us friends just to unload on weekends, just to talk about stuff. And I remember it's been very helpful, you know, when we share our difficulties. It feels lighter when you're so tired at the end of the week and you do a Zoom call with friends, that is not work-related. That that helps a lot psychologically, I guess, that addresses mental health. And I remember when COVID cases were going um, low a little bit. This was before we had another um, lockdown in March, I think. There was a small gathering of journalists at the, at the U.S. Embassy. And we just realized how much we miss, you know, talking to other people face-to-face. And that's that's really something that you know has has had an impact on our mental health, and we really want this pandemic to end soon and have that, you know, uh, interactions with people again because that has been 
a cause of stress for many of us. Of course, we try, we try to survive all of these challenges. Um, but yeah, that, that's very uh, interesting. How about in the Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's uh, very interesting if uh, we know how the difference uh, Indonesia and Manila about how we can to access. Uh, for the expert, especially in psychology uh, expert, how to consultative uh, with our problem. Uh, in Indonesia, very expensive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the number of the number of uh, psychology uh, expert is very range in and very limited uh, resource of all this and. Yeah, um, uh, but but we lucky in the in the online uh, era we can uh, consult it in online and also is uh, very helpful for. Uh... Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mbak Ika, for the additions and also that we have another questions from Hazila from YouTube. Uh, She's asking about what is your most uh, memorable, unique experience during your career. Please, uh, Mbak Ika, how about you? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's very interesting uh, question. Yeah, mm, uh, the big memorable for me um while i cover about the uh, earthquake and tsunami disaster in the palu palu the located in the central uh, sulawesi yeah it's very dangerous and uh, have a big impact for the indonesia because i uh, want the of uh, disaster, you know about uh, liquefaction. <laughs> yeah, liquefaction. Mm. I think it's very new uh, knowledge uh, for me and for some uh, journalists in Indonesia. And uh, this is uh, for first time me to learn more about the liquefaction and so bring uh, my knowledge how. We, we need uh, more literature about the disaster and how to encourage uh, other journalists to more uh, care about the uh, disaster issues because Indonesia have uh, one of the country have a complex uh, disaster and uh, yeah, we need a special list uh, in disaster skills. Thank you, um, Mbak Ika. Uh, how about you, uh, Carmila? I know you mentioned about Marawi earlier, right? And it's right. such an amazing experience, I bet. But do you have another experience or you, are you going to uh, tell a story that you haven't mentioned earlier? Yeah, top of mind only because, you know, I've spent years writing the book, so... It, it becomes the topic that comes to mind automatically. But I think it's always um, investigative stories. When we do investigative stories, we really pour our time on, on this work. And for example, during the pandemic, and because the first stories I've done on the pandemic was the experience of the Diamond Princess cruise ship. I followed the story of the cruise ships. And I think that was interest, a very interesting story during the pandemic, you know, how the, the cruise ships have become a petri dish for coronavirus, just understanding the culture inside cruise ships and why, you know, it has been problematic. And the cruise ships right now, um, a lot of the a lot of the crew members of cruise ships, a lot of seafarers are Filipinos. So this is of particular in interest to Filipinos. And it's just sad how they how many of them have lost their jobs because the cruise ships have been grounded. And then so it's always a discovery when you work on a story, especially if it's investigative, and you come to know about different cultures, you know, lives that you haven't um, known about before that, 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 that people's lives are different based on the circumstances they're in. So I think that that's a, that's a memorable story also for me. Mm. 
Thank you so much. It's very interesting. And we have another question from YouTube. It's from Fadli Maulana Bayhaki. He asked about, do you fear COVID-19 when you already at the field? And do you have some methods to overcome? And also that is it is it really hard working during the pandemic based on your uh, own experience um you want me to start yeah Ika? yeah i think Please, it's, it's def it's definitely we're definitely afraid um mm -hmm. in fact because i was a freelancer uh, last year i had to think hard whether or not i will go to the field to do these stories because I, I I wasn't in a, uh, I didn't have enough, I, I knew I didn't have enough insurance to cover the cost if I had COVID-19. I wouldn't have the support of a company if I if I contracted COVID-19. So we made uh, do, you know, we, there's a lot of Zoom calls and all that. And it's not just about contracting COVID-19 ourselves. It is, our also, it is also our responsibility, you know, that when we meet people in the field, we don't, you know, endanger them. We might, we, we because we, we know there's a lot of uh, asymptomatic cases. We're also concerned that, um, for example, I, I was planning before the pandemic to do a lot of travels um, in, in evacuation centers. Um, even if you are brave, for example, to go to, to, to travel, if you, even if you, are, you don't worry so much about yourself, you have to worry about the people you might expose to, to the virus, you know, because we don't always know if we have it. So certainly, certainly we are always um, uh, concerned and afraid. And we should be. Yes, definitely. We should be. Right, Carmela. And how about you, Maika? Yeah, uh, I'm lucky because uh, in during pandemic, I go in work from home. So I'm very limited to uh of in the fields, yeah, but I have uh, more than responsibility to uh, help other two journalists. We create like a manual book guideline for other journalists, how they can uh, coverage in their job in civil because not all the media industry have a guideline like uh, like two and the guideline uh, can can be uh, you know is very important for other journalists so they can uh, prepare all anything and the equipment and the strategic and also uh, we learn about how the ethical you uh, to cooperate about the COVID-19 issues. Thank you, Mbaika. Well said. And also that we have another questions from Facebook to all the panelists, also to Mbaika and also Carmela. And do you think the world is now awakened in terms of women or is still a long way to go? And based also in base your experience and your own perspective, how do you see it? You want to go first, Ika? <laughs> yeah. Silahkan, Mbak Ika. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we still uh, fight until now to bring a good uh, right and protect the uh, female journalist right yeah so the pandemic make the situation is worse for the female journalists uh, because the um, media situation is collapsed and also uh, the women have uh, harder to work for their uh, family and yeah I, I don't know how the situation can bring uh, the better but I have have a more uh, responsibility in our organization to uh, help 
the woman journalists, um, Alvan, uh, fellowship. In other we uh, need the other solidarity with uh, many women journalists also. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, the Beham work, but I very very <laughs> optimistic uh, we can bring the better. Yeah. In, in the Philippines, um, in terms of leadership positions, there's a lot of women um, in leadership positions of news organizations. So in that sense, um, we can we can reach. I'm I'm the uh, executive director of PCIJ. But as Ika mentioned, you know there are still a lot of problems that we have we have to contend with, especially for example with um, trolling or on, on online attacks. Um, women um, get the uh, are targeted more than more than men, and that's the experience in in the Philippines. And so there's still there's always there's always there's there are always groups working to protect women. Um, so there's always um, some initiatives we can support. And and out maybe even outside of um, the media industry, while there are opportunities for women, there are still glass ceilings that we need to break. So it's a continuous advocacy. That again, we we um, we who are in the position to help fellow women, we should we should do that. Thank you so much, Carmela, and also Mbak Ika. I'm afraid that was our last questions, and the time is up now. Thank you so much to all the panelists, to Mbak Ika, Carmela, and also Nata. Thank and you. You're welcome. And thank you so much for the discussion. I'd like to thank our audience here in Indonesia and also in Thailand and also in the Philippines through the US embassies. And also I'd like to make special mentions to lecturers and teachers from UIN, Sharif Hidayatullah in Jakarta, UIN Walisongo in Semarang, Universitas Indonesia, Universitas Al-Azhar Indonesia, Pondok Pesantren Dar El Kolam, and also our friends from Atma Jaya, also University uh, Undip, University uh, Diponegoro, Universitas Diponegoro, also um, UNPAD, and also uh, UNM. Thank you so much. I think... Uh, it's time for me to say goodbye. Thank you so much for joining us in this uh, special program. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful discussion, Bahana and US Embassy. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Bahana, Mbak Ika, Mrs. Nata, and also Mrs. Carmela. That was a very inspiring and empowering session for us women. So we hope to see you again next time. Now. The rest of you, please don't go anywhere because I have the name of the winner for our social media quiz today. Earlier in this event, I asked you guys, is it true or false that Ruhana Kudus was the first female Indonesian journalist? And the correct answer is true. Ruhana Kudus is the founder of Sunting Melayu newspaper. She has been recognized as a national hero by President Joko Widodo. And our lucky winner for today is at Nico Sudira from Instagram. Congratulations! As I mentioned earlier in the beginning of this event, Ad America is having a very special activities and we're giving out five folding bikes. And how do you participate? You can participate by posting a picture of you doing your favorite eco-friendly activities and post it on your social media at the hashtag Bay Earth Forward and simply tag our social media account at AT America. For further information, you can visit bit.ly slash Bay Earth Forward. Now, you may be wondering, how can I develop an awesome idea for a place like this? Easy. You can go to our website at www.atamerica.or.id, click create an event and collaborate with us. All proposals coming to us will be reviewed and your event might be featured here soon. And while you're on our website, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletters for weekly event updates sent straight to your inbox. 
Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at AT America for fun updates, fun content, and so much more. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. All right, everybody, I think that wraps up this episode. It has been really fun, but unfortunately, we have to say goodbye for now. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Selamat Hari Kartini!